Well, hey, good morning. Welcome. We are live. It is Sunday, January 3rd. That's right. It's 4th of July weekend. If you're watching live with us, if you're watching later on in the week, uh, hope you enjoyed your 4th of July holiday, however you celebrated it. But it is Sunday, July 3rd. It is 4th of July weekend. Welcome to this thing that we call Calvary Online, a worship experience where each and every week we gather together globally across the world to to encourage one another, to challenge one another, to do life together right here online. And we call it Calvary Online. And so I'm super glad that you've chosen to spend a portion of your day with us today when you could be out on a boat, you could be traveling, you could be anywhere doing anything else. But I appreciate and, and I, uh, I, and some of, I applaud you that you have chosen to spend your time with a crazy person such as I uh, in this thing that we call Calvary Online. Well, hey, we ask you each and every week to do one simple thing. We're going to do it once again. If you're new, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Each and every week, we ask you that are watching, whoever you are and wherever you're watching from, whether that be on social media or the online campus, just share our stream because you have no idea how the Lord could use that simple act of sharing, whether it's your social media profile or via text message or email or however you're going to share that, how God could use that simple act to impact someone's life for eternity. And so if you're on Facebook and you're watching, welcome to our Facebook fam, our Facebook community. Hey, just hop down real quick and hit the share button. Uh, so that'll post to your profile if you want to message it and like individually message it to people like hey join me at church you can do that too there if you're watching on the online campus just copy the url uh, or just send people to live.calvarylakeozark.com that's that's the online campus site but uh, send that via text message however you want to send that and uh, we do that each and every week because we want to get the word out about the good news of Jesus that we here at Calvary Online have to offer each and every week. We're really excited about the way the Lord is is using the online ministry uh, to, to reach further than we could have ever reached before just as a physical location. And so I would appreciate that if you do that. We have this really cool uh, feature uh, for our streaming platform where we can see uh, they're called hotspots and we can see when people join and where they're joining from it's really cool uh, uh, just let's geek out together for a second because um, I love technology and that's what you know gets me going um, I uh, I log on after uh, after the services each week to see where people are tuning in from and so uh, if you if you joined last week here's a little here's a little fun piece we um, this was kind of spur of the moment. I didn't have pulled up, so give me one second. Let me pull it up. Um, last week, we had people, we have this map from Google that actually, it's called a heat map, and it shows us little dots, uh, colored dots of where people join us from all across the globe. And so I just want to highlight a few places, uh, a few cities where people joined us from. I'm not going to cover them all because that's not what the point is, but I just want you to know, when we talk about having a community uh, online across the globe that, that you are a part of Calvary. It, this is so much bigger than than you even realize. We had people from Osa here here in the Lake Erie, Osage Beach, Missouri, Village of Four Seasons, Lake Ozark, St. Louis, Ashburn, if I'm saying that, yeah, Ashburn, Virginia, Eldon, Missouri, Four City, North Carolina, House Springs, Missouri, Jeff uh, Jefferson City, Missouri, Pine, Prime, Pine, nope, Prineville, Oregon, like, God is on the move and doing things not only here at Calvary Lake Ozark and in the Lake area, but here at Calvary Online. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is going out across the web each and every week. And so you, when I say welcome everyone across the globe, it's not like seven people watching at home because they decided to stay at home today and not show up to church. That's not what it is at all. People are joining all across the country, all across the world to hang out together, to build community together, to learn and grow and be challenged together here in this thing that we call Calvary Online. And so that's why we push so hard each and every week for you to, to jump into the comments and chat because there are people out there watching. If you're you know, if you're watching on your phone and you're streaming it, you know, to your TV, I would encourage you go grab a computer or another phone and hop in and still chat with us. 
um, we we want to create that community right here at Calvary Online. So if you're like, and listen, I get it. You know, some people are shy people. If they were to show up, you know, here on campus, like the the high five, the welcome, the good morning, it might even be overwhelming. Like, I, I just want to go in and sit down and learn about Jesus. Like, don't talk to me. We get that. But you don't have like, we're not asking you to share your social security number. In fact, don't do that. That's that. Don't do that. But let us know where you're watching from today. Like, hey, I'm watching from city and state or just state or I'm watching with uh, my family or I'm watching by myself or it's 4th of July weekend. What are you doing to celebrate? Are you going to uh, someone's house to celebrate? Are you inviting people to yours? Are you going to watch fireworks? Are you not going to watch fireworks? Do you like fireworks? Are you afraid of fireworks? Like you pick like th there is no like the sky is the limits. We just want to give you an opportunity to interact with others from across the globe right here at Calvary Online. And so do that if you're watching on Facebook in the chat, do that if you're watching uh, on the online campus in the chat. And here's the deal, I would highly encourage you, if you primarily watch on Facebook, hop over to the online campus sometime and watch there. If you primarily watch at the online campus, hop over to Facebook and see that just because the chat may not be going off on, you know, on the online campus doesn't mean it's not going off on Facebook or vice versa. So thanks for diving into like that long explanation, but we, we truly want this to be a community each and every week, gathering all across the globe, being encouraged, growing, being challenged, learning about Jesus and helping others in their walk uh, as we do that together, it, we do that in a digital way right here at Calvary Online. We've got some cool things that are coming. Uh, I'm always constantly thinking and dreaming how to make Calvary Online bigger and better and always um, just leaning into the spirit and allowing him to lead and to guide me and to guide our church specifically when it comes to this thing that we call Calvary Online. But if you were with us last week, just a quick recap. Uh, because I know uh, if you're like me, great. Actually, that's probably not a great thing, but I, life gets busy and we tend to forget. I know that's me. Even when we're in our life group sessions, I'll be, you know, our life group happens on Thursday night and I'll be like, I don't feel like, did I, did I hear the right sermon? Cause I don't remember. So real quick, last week we, uh, we covered uh, Jesus is six. Yep, six. You, if you didn't know that, I would highly encourage you to go back and watch last week's message. We covered Jesus's six trials leading up to uh, his death, which we're going to cover here today. But we we covered uh, Matthew 27, uh, 27. Nope, that was today. Sorry. <laughs> See, I told you. I already forgot. 27, 11 through 26. Uh, Pastor Nick titled that message before Pilate um, and the and the other. Uh, how, how am I? Uh, man, my brain totally just went blank. Uh, sorry, he titled his message before Pilate, looking at one of the six trials, uh, probably the one that we most know when it comes to Jesus's trial, death, uh, and burial. Um, and so we covered that last week, and today we're walking into uh, the actual crucifixion of Jesus. And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 27. We'll start in verse 27 and run all the way to verse 44 uh, before we we close up uh, 27 next week. So we'll close up 27 next week. But I do just want to give um, a, a caution. I don't want to say warning. That sounds too strong. I do want to give just a, a little caution here this morning. Because we're covering the crucifixion, uh, Pastor Nick is going to talk uh, not extensively in detail, but he is going to be very specific. Uh, not only obviously what the Bible says, but also from a medical standpoint about what is going on um, to Jesus and specifically to his body as he's get uh, as he's being beaten and then eventually as he's hanging on the cross and what is going on not in a scary way but just in a holistic helping paint a picture of what Jesus is enduring and suffering through on behalf of you and I and so if you have littles that are watching this morning uh, I would highly encourage you uh, let even if that means turning off this morning or go putting on a right now media um, show for kids. If you have no idea what right now media is, let me know in the comments. I can get you an account. It's basically the Christian Netflix 
um, that has tons of amazing uh, kids resources and Bible stories all in video format. And so you could play that in another room. But I just want to, if that's something as a parent or a guardian, we want to let you make that decision for, for your specific family. But we didn't want you to be caught off guard because you know, let's be honest, nobody likes being caught off guard, especially uh, if you're a parent or a guardian, you understand when it comes to your kids, you like to kind of be in the know and be thinking and processing. And so just giving you a heads up for today's message. Uh, the kind of avenue and path that Pastor Nick is going to take. Uh, I, I am, I'm excited for this morning. I That might sound weird as we talk about the crucifixion, uh, which is just saying Jesus' death. But for me, the hope that I find in Jesus' death gives me hope for today. Even as I turn on the TV, which I try not to anymore, and and I try to even stay away from social media as much as possible because it just seems that when you turn those mediums on, how much vitriol and hatred and how quickly it looks like the world is going to hell in a handbasket, how bad it looks. And, and it helps me like today for me is just going to be another refocus on who Jesus is and what he gave up for you and for me and how in control he is, even in the times that it doesn't seem like he's in control. And so I am excited for this morning. I'm hoping that even in um, uh, what could seem like a darker message that, that God would encourage us, that he would also challenge us. That's our hope and our prayer each and every week that we'd hold those things in tandem that we never wanna give just an encouraging feel good message and we don't ever want to just challenge over and over again without any hope. We want to hang those in tandem like Pastor Nick says. And we want to offer those together that if you find yourself in a place where you need hope and encouragement, we want to offer that. And let's be honest, every single one of us watching today in some form, in some way needs hope and encouragement. But at the same time, like scripture says, we, we need to continue to grow and to be challenged and to be a reflection of God's goodness and who he is to those around us, to be a light in the darkness, to be a mirror for who God is. And, and so trust me, uh, I know that this past week, I, I can think of a few specific times that I was not a mirror for the grace, for the love, for the acceptance, that that jesus offers and so man i'm with you this morning uh, i need to be challenged I, I need to have some things in my heart and in my world that the lord needs to kind of break down and rebuild up uh, for his kingdom and his sake because i had built them up for Jeron's kingdom and for Jeron's sake and so i want to invite you this morning that that you would find hope and encouragement in the message and that you would be willing to allow God to work in your heart, to challenge you, to encourage you to be more like him as we do this thing globally together that we call Calvary Online. I'm excited for this morning. I'm excited to take this journey with you. Before we hand it off to Andy and the team, can I just pray for you? I want to pray for you, whatever your story is, whatever you're going through, that God would encourage your heart, that he would give you hope, and that you would be challenged today. Uh, as, as we walk through the rest of our service. So let's go before the Lord in prayer as we embark on this journey together. Father God, this morning, we are so grateful that we could join together in this medium called Digital Online Ministry. God, I pray that even in the ways that may feel disconnected, even in the ways that may feel weird and awkward, God, that we wouldn't be afraid to press into the awkward, that we wouldn't be afraid to press into the uncomfortable, God, that this morning, for every single person watching, whether they're aware of it or not, God, that you would offer hope, that you would offer encouragement, that you would offer healing, but God, at the same time, that we would be willing to allow you to tear down the things in our life, to strategically and surgically slice out the things in our life that are sinful and not of you, that, that we would be challenged, that we would press into the uncomfortable, God. That this morning, whether it be through hanging out together here before we we dive into worship and uh, and the t reading and teaching of God's word, whether it be through the worship, whether that it be through the message, God, whatever portion of service that you use, God, would you use uh, this service today to encourage, to offer hope, to challenge us to be more like you. God, I pray for the rest of service. I pray for the team. 
I pray that you would lead them to be your hands, to be your feet, to be a vessel, uh, to communicate the message and the hope that you have to offer to everybody watching today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, right after service, I'm going to come back. I'm going to close out service, offer a few things uh, of hope and encouragement, specifically after Nick's message today. I'll see you following the message.
Good morning, Calvary Online. Or if you are watching at another part of the day, it might not even be Sunday, and we're okay with that. Not a big deal whatsoever. Just glad that you are joining us as we are jumping into the Gospel of Matthew. We are, again, just walking verse by verse, chapter by chapter, as is our style. And we are in Matthew 27, uh, and we are this Sunday, today, talking about the crucifixion. The, the pinnacle of our faith with the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. And so uh, let's jump into this Matthew 27, starting in verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. So this is probably like 600 men. And it's not so much a sense that they're trying to uh, uh, protect themselves from Jesus. They're probably protecting Jesus from this rioting crowd or whatever that's going on outside. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Um, other gospels would say purple, both fit. It'd be a, this reddish purple type tint, which was honestly very valuable. Like the, that, those colors were of royalty just because it was very costly to have like a reddish purple type garment. Those, those were more a little bit more rare. So they stripped him, they put the scarlet robe on him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him, and they led him away to crucify him. And so if you remember clear back, I think it's in 20... Six. I'm going to turn the page just so I make sure. Yeah, at the end of 26, when Jesus is arrested by the chief priest and the religious elite, um, they strike him and they spit on him and they're saying, hey, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is that that struck you? And so you had the Jews mocking him and beating him, and now you have the Romans doing the exact same thing, but for different reasons. The Jews beat him and mocked him because... Uh, they didn't believe he was the Messiah, and then hear the Romans because he's not king or king of the Jews. And so, same treatment, two different people, two different reasons. Verse 32, And as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. So this is a guy named Simon. He's from North Africa. Uh, and so he is traveled into Jerusalem, obviously, for Passover He's going to be celebrating Passover. Uh, it was a pilgrimage type of feast, and so there were Jews from all over. So a very eclectic uh, group of people that would probably have witnessed everything that happened uh, with Jesus and, and the crucifixion, the resurrection. There would have been just an influx of population there. And so as they're walking Jesus to uh, Golgotha, the Calvary, the place where they're going to crucify him, uh, he comes, becomes very exhausted, cannot carry his cross, and so to keep, uh, keep schedule, keep on time, they grab a guy out of the crowd and force him to carry the cross. And yeah, at this point, most likely Jesus is just carrying the cross beam that his arms would have been, his hands would have been nailed to. You know, the vertical pole probably uh, honestly stayed there. They would just nail him to that and then hoist him up. And, you know, sometimes the movies depict it differently and... Uh, most likely that's how that was going down. So um, he's just carrying the crossbar, which the whole cross itself could be up to 300 pounds. And so after you've been scourged and beaten and he's, he's exhausted, he, the emotional, psychological uh, burden that he's carrying in this, like he's, his body's just wearing out at this point. And so they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, uh, which in Latin is where we get the word Calvary from. That's that's where we, you know, so we are a Calvary chapel. Calvary means, uh, in Latin, Golgotha, the place of the skull. And so I was joking with the staff even earlier. I was like, what if we got just real biblical about our name? And instead of saying Calvary, which is Latin, let's, you know, it's, our church would be called Golgotha, Lake Ozark. Place of the skull, Lake Ozark. Calvary, Lake Ozark. So, I don't know. Maybe we get like a little flag with a skull and crossbones. No, those are pirates. Never mind. 34. Then they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And so gall is something that they would 
uh, it, would, it came from a liver of the animal and it was kind of a narcotic type numbing agent, not just physically with pain, but even um, for your mind, you know, so they're, uh, when somebody was going to be facing this, they would give them a high dose of this narcotic type drink just to ease them, not just physically, but also emotionally, psychologically from it. So if they're pretty much high as a kite, they're not understanding the full weight of what's going on to make this process a little bit easier. But So they offer it to him to drink, but Jesus won't drink it. He wants to approach the cross, approach this crucifixion in full awareness, full understanding um, of mind. And so verse 35, and so when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. And they sat down and kept watch over him. And so that fulfills Psalm 22, 18, that the, the prophecy talks about how uh, it's a messianic uh, psalm. So you can go back and read Psalm 22. It's pointing to Jesus, pointing to the cross. And it specifically talks about that they're going to cast lots for his clothes. Uh, there's actually a lot in that psalm pointing uh, to the cross. And so, uh, and I love in verse 35, they, Matthew just said, and then they crucified him. And what's hard is we, we, in our normal everyday life, don't have an understanding of what that means. But for someone in this culture, someone in this uh, time period and living in or near Jerusalem, specifically in the Roman Empire, they absolutely knew that. Like, Matthew didn't need to put extra details with it because... Everybody had a common knowledge of what a Roman crucifixion was. And, and Rome didn't invent crucifixion. It was actually the Persians. Um, and they crucified people up on a cross type thing because it was in a way that they honored the God of the earth. They didn't want these dead bodies defiling the earth because that were the different gods of Persia. And so it's something that Rome took from Persia. But even though they didn't invent it, they perfected it. And a crucifixion wasn't meant to be a really fast death, you know, kind of like what in a sense of capital punishment that we have today with lethal injection. That is a very quick process with medications that will, you know, stop the heart and different things like that. Uh, crucifixion was meant to be a very slow, drawn out, excruciating, painful, like they, they wanted your life to just slowly fade from your body. Like they did not want this to be a quick process. They wanted to bring as much agony, humiliation, pain, suffering as possible. And so they didn't invent it, but they definitely perfected it. And so they sit down, they're watching over Jesus. Is That was their role. There was usually about a, a squad of like four men and they were the ones that would carry out a crucifixion. And, and if they did not succeed, if you know crowds came up and wanted to take the body down or take the person down before they passed away or whatever, they would be killed. You know, there, So some people have that, you might hear that theory that uh, it's called a swoon theory, that Jesus just passed out on the cross. And then when Joseph of Arimathea took him down, the disciples later revived him. And that's how he resurrected and came back from the dead. Uh, that absolutely has no weight whatsoever in the culture because um, if, if a Roman soldier did not carry out his orders, you know, he would be killed. They, Rome was, was very gnarly like that. They had no heart whatsoever. You followed orders or we'll kill you and find somebody that can. And so they're watching over them to make sure that their job's going to get done. And over his head, they put a charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Very normal. That would have been with anybody, not with just Jesus. Um, then two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. And if he desires, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. And so we have this scene, Jesus going from 
the trial with Pilate, finally uh, given the order to be executed. They walk him, which uh, kind of infamously is called the Via Della Rosa. It's the path that Jesus walked to be crucified on the way. He can't carry his cross anymore, so they grab this guy out of the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, which is kind of fun because if you look at Mark 15, uh, verse 21, and if you look at Romans 16, 13, there's mentioning of his sons. So in Mark, he says, oh, this is, uh, this is Simon the Cyrene, and, you know, his sons are Alexander and Rufus. And Mark says that, and the mentality that they would be known to who Mark was writing to. They would know who Simon's sons were. And then even in Romans 16, Paul says, uh, you know, greet Rufus and his mother, for she was even a mother to me. She was a mom figure even to me. And so it's not that just Paul knew of a Rufus. He knew him very well. He knew his mom, Simon's wife then. And so... Uh, uh, kind of the the idea, the speculation, which makes sense to me, Simon comes to Jerusalem to be able to sacrifice his Passover lamb, and but he meets the Lamb of God who is sacrificed for him. So when all these Jews came to Jerusalem, a lot of them stayed, and we read that from Acts, that because of what happened with Jesus, they didn't go home. They stayed there. And that's why other ones were giving um, their possessions in their house and nobody had need because they had all these out-of-towners that didn't want to go home because of everything that was going on with Jesus. And I believe Simon, uh, the man of Cyrene from North Africa, was one of these guys who later, uh, maybe at this point or, or very uh, shortly afterwards, became a believer. You know, could you imagine in three days Jesus rising from the dead and he's appearing to over 500? Easily could have been a Simon right there. And it's like, I carried that guy's cross. Like, I, I took him and the cross all the way there and I saw him and he, he died and now appeared or he heard stories of like, uh, or reports that Jesus rose from the dead and, and leaned into that. But at some point he becomes a believer uh, and we see that his sons are a part of the church and actually fairly well known within the early church. And so they take Jesus, they walk him to Golgotha, the place of the skull, and they offer him wine to drink. He says, no, doesn't drink from it. And then they crucify him again. Not giving many details because there would have been a common knowledge, but for us that are a little bit removed, um, let's dig into this and could get a little gory. And so I just want to give the fair warning there if you're watching with kids, going to get pretty specific on a few things. So even before this point when Jesus was scourged, you know, it was a cat of nine tails type of a whip um, that the Roman soldiers would use. And they would string up the person like they'd have a, a, a pole or a post and they'd string them up over that so that the back muscles were up and nice and tight. And so they would take and there would be a Roman soldier on each side of them. They'd have this cat of nine tails style whip at the ends. There would be. Uh, like ball bearing type things or little pieces of bone and metal. And so the ball bearings would hit and just cause bruising and contusions, um, even possibly, you know, breaking some ribs here and there. The, the little pieces of metal and bone would uh, obviously just ripping skin and flesh. And there's reports that when people were scourged by the Romans like this, that, you know, th their skeletal muscles, even their skeleton would be, uh, visible bones, organs would fall out of cavities. It was a very gruesome, very bloody process. And this is just the scourging. Some people didn't even survive this aspect of it. So they were going to be scourged and then crucified. They wouldn't have made it this far. Um, scripture tells us that Jesus was unrecognizable as, as even a man, that he was beaten that bad. And so this would have started a whole lot of uh, trauma to his body. So when you have a, a massive amount of blood loss, then you got concerns of going into shock and, um, you know, the body with a lot of blood loss like that, what will happen is they'll, the body will quit sending blood to the extremities and other organs and it'll try to keep blood just going to the heart and to the brain. And, and so there's shock. And so Jesus, his heart rate is probably going up. His blood pressure is dropping, his pulse again, going crazy. 
his rep respirations are probably increasing and just so his his body is going through a a very physically uh, painful it's even kind of hard to describe it and that's that's actually you know one of the questions how bad is crucifixion well it, case in point our English word of excruciating comes from the Roman word out of the cross so we have the word excruciating because of the cross and of the crucifixion and so it, so he's just getting whipped so there would be two Roman guards just one after another just hitting them and a lot of times we think it's just like a whip and it would just come across the body like that and really the that that bone and metal pieces would stick into the flesh and then they would kind of whip it back to rip flesh and bone and it was just it was it was just horrible and then so a lot of blood loss a lot of shock a lot of pain that's going on right there then they dress them up and so they're putting clothes on them so imagine having this just very open wounded not even just his back but just his whole body they're putting a scarlet robe on him the crown of thorns that they're beating into his head and and so we see the physical aspect that Jesus went through which you know we'll continue talking about um, but also don't overlook the emotional and psychological where he is just being mocked and spit and and made fun of and just sometimes though that with the combination of the two like it wasn't just oh he caught a beating but just every aspect of who he was as a man was being uh, painfully tortured not just physically but emotionally psychologically just a horrible thing and so then you uh, carried your cross through town again that's called the Via Della Rosa you can actually go there and see the tour of of where Jesus walked and they believe they have the path for it and and so all of uh, the city would have came out and seen this you would have carried your cross you would have had hung around your neck your charges of what you were guilty of and why you were going to be crucified there would have been a a Roman guard on a horse leading the procession there would have been another one shouting out your crime because they wanted all the people to know if you challenge Rome this is what happens and so you might be guilty of the same crime and or so if you're if you're doing something similar to what this guy's doing no one understand this is how Rome's going to treat you you know and so anybody that was going to be crucified this was it was illegal to crucify a Roman uh, citizen it was it, some uh, ancient historians said this is not even fit for slave people who they thought were just subhuman like this was a horrible horrible thing to happen horrible death to have to endure and so then you walk and you just have all these crowds watching you and 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 you, honestly you might have recognized a few people I mean obviously Jesus spent a lot of time in Jerusalem and this is the same Jesus that was teaching in the temple the same Jesus that was doing miracles and and just walking around and being with people and going to weddings and feasts and and now he's walking bloody beaten on his way to be crucified so once they would get there um, they would nail uh, your hands into the crossbar and a, a lot of people think it's here even sign language for Jesus is that but really they would nail they put the nail here between your two arm bones and there's a couple nerves that uh, are running through there and so uh, just the excruciating pain every time you had to move on the cross would just send bolts of just pain through your whole body um, it was very uh, common for the person's hands to kind of clench up like a claw and you can even kind of just kind of mess with your wrist and see that when you squeeze it so you're just in this tight tense painful restrictive type of state um, so they would nail you there um, then they would line up your feet and do the same thing there's a couple bones that they want to go right between there were some nerves that would just cause again excruciating pain because when you were on the cross you would have to pull up to be able to breathe your body weight would cause you to suffocate on your own body weight and so like asphyxiation and so you would have to pull your body up well every time you pulled up you know those nails would rub on the inside of your arms again shooting pain through your arms and legs from those uh, pierce sites and then your backs already tore up right 
And so you're rubbing up against this wooden uh, cross that's just causing more pain to your back. You're, you're digging your heel into the side of it. There's reports that, that people would dig their heel till clear to the bone from it. And, and, and then the other reports of how they would just be caked with dirt and insects and and there's reports how bodies would hang on crosses for days that birds would come and eat hanging flesh off of victims that they weren't even dead yet that they're getting picked and prodded by wild animals and even after you died they would just leave you up there for the wild beast to eat you they didn't care and so this this is excruciating and so you would just pull yourself up you're trying to catch a little bit of a breath before you'd sink back down and that's how they do it and they would just slowly let your energy fade and, and let it be a muscle cramps that were going on and slowly slowly you wouldn't be able to pick yourself up to get more and more oxygen to your body and you would just slowly suffocate on your own body weight and that's how you died on the cross and if there was any doubt to make sure that you were dead they always would deliver a death blow um, the guys on the cross next to Jesus we understand they broke their legs with Jesus they did a a spear to his side. Um, sometimes they would just do like a, a death blow, like they'd crush your skull or they, uh, some reports that they would light you on fire. And so just a horrible, horrible death. Again, that's where we get our word excruciating from. One commentator wrote this and I thought this was a really great quote. Consider how heinous sin must be in the sight of God when it requires such a sacrifice. And so when we see what Jesus went through physically, when we see what he went through emotionally, psychologically, when we see what he went through spiritually, which we'll talk a little bit next time um, as we continue in Matthew 27, when we consider that he went through all of that because of the sin of the world, how heinous sin must be in the sight of God if that kind of sacrifice was needed and so he's on the cross then he's people are walking by and they're seeing him they're hurling insults at him I mean even the guys on the cross next to him at, at some points are doing the exact same thing but listen to what they say you know verse 40 you would destroy the temple rebuild it in three days save yourself if you are the Son of God come down from the cross Again, they're mocking him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. The fact that Jesus stayed on the cross proved that he was the Son of God, proved his divine sonship. Because if Jesus saved himself, then nobody else could be saved. So when it says, you saved others, but you can't save yourself, that's exactly right. I don't think they understood the weight of what they were saying and mocking Jesus. Yes, to save others, he cannot save himself. And if he does save himself, then there is no hope of salvation because nobody else can remedy the sin problem that we have. And so they're, they're mocking him, but I don't think they even understand the fullness of the truth of it. And what I, one of the things they say is, oh, let him come down from the cross, then we will believe in him. What they don't understand is in three days, he's going to rise and walk out of the grave and they still won't believe in him. So they're even mocking in that. They truly didn't mean it. If Jesus really came down from the cross, they weren't going to believe him because he's going to come up from the grave and they still don't. He's still rejected from that. And it says he trusts in God. Let him deliver him now. And that's the thing is, again, it's not God's timing. That is not when God is going to deliver Jesus. He's going to deliver him in three days when he walks out of the tomb, but not at the cross. Not at the cross. And he does trust in God. He completely surrenders his, to his will, to, uh, you know, we even go back to the garden when he's praying, he says, not my will be done, but your will be done. So he does trust in God. So they're saying very truthful statements, but they are mocking in what he does. And so Jesus, able to save himself, but doesn't. Why? Because he knows the Father's plan, that his sacrifice is what is needed to save the world. And if you go back to Matthew 20, verse 28, said that Jesus said, I didn't come to save his life, but to give his life as a ransom for sinners. Jesus knew this was always the plan. You know, some 
critical scholars look and say, oh, Jesus was just trying to be a religious leader, kind of a cult leader, and because there was too much of an uprising against Rome, that's why he was killed. No, no, the cross wasn't a reactionary thing in Jesus' life. This isn't something that just accidentally happened and wasn't a part of the plan. Jesus always knew that he was going to be delivered, that he was going to be crucified, that he was going to be uh, rise from the like he always knew this was a part of God's plan and that he came not to save his life but he knew I came to give my life as a ransom for sinners and so when we look at the cross this is the summit of man's hatred for God that God would come to earth in the person of Jesus and this is what they did to him and so you just see the summit of man's hatred for God when left completely unchecked you know, would we reject God? We will crucify him. But also, it is the peak of God's love for man, that even though man would do that to him, Jesus willingly laid down his life for the ransom of sinners to be able to endure this for our salvation. And so when we talk about our faith and what it costs us, we always have to start at the cross. We have to understand what it cost God for us to be able to be redeemed and reconciled to him. And so we can never doubt God's love for us, which for me, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes it's been hard. There's been times in my life where I've doubted God's love for me, but we can never doubt God's love for us when we remember what he endured to reveal, to accomplish, to secure salvation for us. And so uh, one of the things I say frequently, I never want to become numb to the cross. I never want this uh, idea of the cross and Jesus on the cross, what he endured on the cross to become apathetic in my life. I never want to become numb to it. I, I always want the reality, the pain, the hurt, the just the realness of what happened. I always want that to be very prevalent and known in my life. I never want to become numb to it. I don't want it to be old news. I Every time I hear and read about the cross, I want it to impact me in a deeper, more real way because what he endured, what he gave up, his blood shed was for me. That I could have hope, not just in glory, but I can have hope even now. And understanding that the cross, this right here, the pinnacle of our faith is right here between the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It gives us complete fulfillment, gives us complete purpose in who we are as followers of Jesus. And so anytime that we struggle to understand God's love for us, look to the cross, never become numb to it. So let me pray for us, and then we'll kick it back over to Jerome to close out the service. Thank you guys so much for joining, and we will see you next time. Father, we love you, we trust you, and we just thank you. Thank you for what you endured in sending your son to the cross. Truly excruciating. The pain of, of what you endured out of the cross. Even, even words need to be created and invented to try to articulate what happened. And we can talk about the physical pain, we can talk about the emotional, we can talk about the psychological, we can talk about the, the spiritual thing that happened with, with you becoming sin for us. But I pray, Lord, that we would never become numb to it. That we would understand that it was done because this was your will, this was your desire, because of your love, for us. So we surrender and submit our lives to you. That if you sacrificed everything for us, should we not respond in like manner, willing to lay down our lives for the sake of Christ. And so use us, Lord, that we would be useful vessels in your hands to be a reflection of this same love that sent Jesus to the cross. Let us be a reflection of that same love to a lost, broken, dark world around us. That the same hope that we have in you on the cross, up and out of the grave, I pray that we would share that hope with those in our sphere of influence, those around us. Give us that kind of faith, that kind of courage. 
that kind of boldness, Lord. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Thank you guys, and we will see you next time. Well, thank you, Pastor Nick, for such an encouraging and challenging message as we looked at the crucifixion, the, the actual death of Jesus on the cross and what it means for us as believers and what it means for those that would, would be considered or identify themselves as non-believers is as Pastor Nick was talking, I, I wrote this down and I wanted to I wanted to write down because I'm quoting him word for word. But for me, it was one of those moments like we talked about pre-service that was encouraging, but at the same time, it was incredibly challenging. And Pastor Nick said this, Every time I read about the cross, I want it to impact me in a deeper and mo more profound way because of what he, Jesus, endured and what he, Jesus, gave up, his bloodshed for me. That, that you and I could have hope, not only for the life after this world, but, but in addition to the hope that is offered to you and I as believers for this world. This is not our home. We are aliens in this world, but that doesn't mean that we just coast and that we sit back and long for uh, the future to get away. It is our job for those of us that call ourselves Christians, like Pastor Nick said, to continually reflect on Jesus's crucifixion because in between Jesus's crucifixion and his resurrection is the pinnacle of our belief because if Jesus just died that doesn't that that isn't a, a holistic complete picture because people die Jesus had to defeat death in the grave and raise again to sh to uh, for the existence of you and I to have hope in him unlike any other I said that. Let's redo that. Three, two, one. Well, thank you guys for sticking around and hanging to the end. Thank you so much, Pastor Nick, for a challenging and encouraging message as we look at the last moments of Jesus's life uh, into his actual death. As, uh, as Pastor Nick was talking, I, I wrote down something that he said. I, I just said he kept going, I kept going back, like, hold on, wait a second. Um, he said this, and it was one of those moments for me, like we talked about pre-service, that was challenging um, and encouraging uh, in tandem, one of the things. But he said this, every time I read about the cross, I want it to impact me in a deeper and more profound way because of what he, Jesus, endured and what he gave up his bloodshed for me. That you and I, in the act of submission, of laying down his life, Jesus chose, Jesus chose not to call all of heaven's angels and armies down to prove how in control he is. He voluntarily laid down his life for you and I, that his bloodshed and his eventual resurrection, which we'll look at soon, um, and his resurrection would be the payment and the success story for you and for me. That as sinners, we would have the hope that we, we would be offered this, this free gift of salvation. That we, would be, that we would be offered something that we so don't deserve, but that God wants us to have. And all he asks of us is to, to in submission, lay down our own lives, not physically, um, but spiritually to lay them at his feet and say, God, you are in control. I invite you into my life. And so this morning, uh, man, if you've never made that decision for Jesus, it's not a prayer that saves you. It, it's not even necessarily the decision that saves you. It, it's the act of submitting your life to the Lord, moving yourself out of the driver's seat and moving into the passenger seat saying, God, I, I submit my life to you. I give all authority and control over to you. If you've never made that decision, man, what a great day as, as we 
talk about and we celebrate and, and we think about and, and we wrestle with what Jesus' death was actually like, both from a scriptural point of view, but also as Pastor Nick talked about the medical point of view, that Jesus chose to lay down his life so that you and I might find hope and encouragement in the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the good news for you and for me that would give us hope, not for beyond the grave, but also while we're waiting for beyond the grave, for the time that you turn on the news, for the time that you scroll through social media, for the situation that you may be facing right now, that this isn't a one and done thing. This is a continual every moment of every day submitting to the authority of God. If you've never made that decision, I want to invite you this morning to place your hope, to place your faith and your confidence in the Lord Jesus. It's not a prayer that saves you. And here in a moment to wrap up service, we'll pray. But you making that decision to hand over the keys of your life, I'm telling you, it's not going to fix. Let me, let me be very clear. This isn't a, I'm going to give God control and my finances are going to fix themselves. My relationships are going to fix themselves and anything and everything that's going wrong in my life is going to fix itself. I want to be very clear about that. That That is not the gospel of Jesus. That's not what being a Christian means. It means that life is going to happen. It means that hard things are absolutely going to continue to happen in your life. But when, not if, when those things happen, the hope, the encouragement, the unity, the relationship that we find in Jesus and in the church gives us the strength, gives us the perseverance to push through those, those tragic situations, to push through the days where we just want to throw the towel in. I know for my wife and I, we we uh, just here a few months ago walked through a season in our life. Where we we had a miscarriage, and and for us, um, man, just holding holding the like we talked about on Sunday morning, holding the encouraging portion with the challenging portion. Man, the hope that I had at the same time that I had so many questions. I know God's good. I know that he's faithful. I know that he's in control, but in my finite mind and my selfish, fleshy, personal mind, trying to, to wrap my head around it and the way that we experience the love and the grace of Jesus in that time in our life through uh, simple text messages, through people just wanting to live life with us and be there for us and not try to fix it. And those moments, those were the moments that I saw Jesus through the eyes of a staff member, uh, you know, that I saw Jesus uh, in, in a frozen meal. And I know it sounds weird, but it's what we're called to do as Christians is to reflect what Jesus has done for us that you and I, listen, I'm not on this screen. I'm not a pastor because my life is all together. I, I can tell you right now, last week, three very specific times without even even trying to think about it, that I allowed my flesh, that I allowed my sinful nature, that I allowed my selfishness to, to regain control in my life when it should have been, hey, completely, completely Lord led and Lord given. I just said, no, no, scoot over. Like it's my turn to drive. And man, for me today, I, I wanna be like Pastor Nick. Every time I read about the cross, every time I hear the cross, Every time I see the cross on a necklace that I, I wouldn't be, become so numb to what the cross means. It is, it is a representation of death and excruciating pain. And what that means for us as Christians is that Jesus submitted his life to the excruciating pain so that you and I wouldn't suffer torment eternally that that when we place our confidence and our hope in Jesus that, that we would be given eternal life as the Bible says eternal life there is life everlasting even after this one and so I want to encourage you with that today I want to challenge you for for maybe you watching who who's grown up in church or or identifies as Christian that that you that you hold fast, that you don't give up, that, that you spend time this week allowing the Lord to, to search your heart for the things that he needs to strategically and surgically remove the sinful portions of our life 
that he would allow um, trusted individuals in your life to speak truth in love to you about things that might need to change because I know I need it as much as you might need it. And so church, let's do that together this week. Let's not be afraid to walk into the uncomfortable. Let's not be afraid to be challenged. Let's not be afraid to have hard conversations. And sometimes we need to have those hard conversations first with ourselves before we do them with others. And so that's my challenge to you here today is as you go about the rest of your day and the rest of your week, before we join back together next week for another Calvary Online worship experience. That's that's my hope, that's my prayer, that's my challenge is, is that this week we, we would spend time searching ourselves, that we would allow the Lord to, to move in our lives, maybe in new and creative ways or maybe ways that he's already moving that you would just give him the freedom to do that. And man, hey, if you made a decision this morning, if you, if you place your confidence and your faith and your hope in Jesus, whether it be the, for the first time, you're just like, man, I need to work on some things in my own life. I want that. Lord, I would love to connect with you. I'd love to walk alongside you. Uh, just shoot you a few text message or an email or a phone call and just I'd love to hear your story don't be afraid to reach out let me know in the comments fill out the digital connect card however you need to get a hold of me I would love to hear your story and hear about what led to the Lord working and moving in your life that helped you make that decision here today well hey I want to do this as we close out our time together I want to pray I want to pray for you and your story and your situation that we continue this week pressing on pressing forward, stepping into the things that God has called us to. So let's pray together, church. Father God, thank you so much for church today. God, thank you for the movement of your spirit that is going on. God, thank you so much for each and every person that placed their faith, their hope, their confidence in you, God, that they've given control of their life over to you, that they've submitted their authority to you, God, that you would lead and guide their life, that you would encourage them, that you would challenge them, that you would strengthen them. God, that you would do that in all of us this week, that we would allow ourselves to, to be and to act and to look more like you, to be a reflection of who you are while we're shopping with our family for groceries, while we're in the line at Starbucks. God, wherever we find ourselves this week, Without uttering a single word, would people see and know that there's something different about us? Would you give us opportunities to share that love, to share the gospel with people this week? Lord, we're so grateful that you woke us up, that you gave us life and breath today. And Lord, go with us this week as we go back to work, as we spend time with our families, as we hang out this 4th of July weekend. God, would you keep us safe? Would you allow us to rest in your goodness? Would you allow us to rest in who you are. God, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, Calvary Online, love you. Have a great week. We'll see you back here next week for another worship experience. But until then, go live life for Jesus. See you guys.